Hello. Uh, okay. So, um, so let me uh, recap what uh, we did last time. Uh, so we talked about the SVD. Uh, so we have a matrix E which, with, with general dimensions, m by n, the rank is R, which is less than or equal to the minimum of the two dimensions. And uh, A can be written as uh, basically this product. So we have here a unitary matrix uh, on the left, unitary matrix on the right, and between them uh, is a matrix, uh, like its uh, upper, uh, upper uh, left uh, part uh, is basically a diagonal R by R matrix, where R is the rank. Uh, and uh, you can eliminate basically the z use the zeros here in this sigma matrix to write down the reduced SVD, which can also be written as this uh, weighted sum of the outer products. Uh, the elements, you know, the so basically the elements on the main diagonal of S, those are the singular values, and uh, uh, the, the columns of U are the left uh, singular vectors, and the columns of V are the right singular vectors. Okay. And this can be done to any uh, to any matrix. Um, now, uh, you can use the SVD to do many things. In fact, it's it's one of the most powerful, uh, basically, uh, and most like practically useful uh, tools. Um, so you can use them actually to compute uh, the more bin rows pseudo inverse, uh, which is basically a matrix of size n by m, which is given by this expression here. And uh, the pseudo inverse itself of a matrix uh, is involved in the very famous uh, least squares problem. So if you have A, uh, a known matrix, and you have vector B, a, a known vector, and you want to find a vector X of uh, uh, in the n dimensional space such that the L2 norm of the difference between AX and B uh, to be minimized, uh, then basically the way to go is regardless of, you, you do not need to make any assumptions regarding A, uh, basically uh, the solution is uh, A, uh, A uh, dagger B, which is the pseudo inverse of A multiplied by B. Uh, sometimes this is not a unique solution. It depends on whether uh, the null space of A is uh, trivial or non-trivial. If it's non-trivial, then actually there is an infinite number of solutions because you can take this guy and add to it any vector from the non-space of A. Another very important like sort of uh, uh, understanding of SVD is that suppose that you have a matrix A and you want another matrix uh, such that, okay, so we have A and we have another matrix B and so uh, same size as A, so M by N, M by N, uh, but you want to force the rank of matrix B to be uh, to be basically a K, uh, where K is some number that is strictly less than R, the rank of matrix A. So this is a low rank approximation. So you want to approximate a matrix by a matrix of lower rank. Note that uh, a lower rank matrix, uh, you know, if you, if you think of the matrix uh, in terms of this summation here, okay, how many terms do we have in this summation? So basically this summation involves the strictly positive singular values. So basically the number of terms in this sum is equal to the rank. So a, a, a matrix with a smaller rank, it means that you need fewer terms in this summation. So it's, you can think of it as sort of compressing, compressing the uh, matrix. Um, so the low, rank, the low rank approximation, again, and now uh, you, you need to, like, to design matrix B such that it is, uh, quote unquote, close to matrix A. Uh, and so we have a number of ways of doing this. If you choose, uh, basically, B uh, to uh, such that the Frobenius norm of the difference between A and B to be minimized, uh, then B is, uh, you know, the solution is very simple. The solution is you go to A, do its SVD, and then you set the singular values, um, sigma, uh, sigma K plus 1, sigma K plus 2, up to sigma R to 0. So basically, uh, singular values above K, you know, you set them equal to 0. And this will be your uh, best uh, rank K approximation to matrix A. Okay, um, and now uh, let's talk about matrix norms. Um, matrix norms, uh, basically, uh, they satisfy basically the properties of a vector norm. Uh, okay, so a matrix norm is a function. Uh, you feed it a matrix. Okay, so the norm, uh, you give it a matrix as an input, and it responds to you. It responds uh, to you in the output uh, by a non-negative number. Okay, so basically, you get something that is strictly positive or is equal to zero. Uh, so the norm is always greater than or equal to zero, okay? And uh, um, the norm is zero if and only if we are talking about the O0 matrix, 
okay, which means that the norm of, uh, for something to qualify as a matrix norm, uh, if you give it the original matrix, it should spit out zero. And if the norm, if we know that the, the norm of, the matrix norm of some matrix is equal to zero, then we know that we are talking about the particular all zero matrix. And then we have homogeneity, which means that, you know, basically if the matrix is multiplied by a complex C, uh, then uh, the norm is the norm of A multiplied by the magnitude of C. And then we have the triangle inequality, uh, it, telling you that basically this function is sub-additive, um, the uh, matrix norm of A plus B is less than or equal to the matrix norm of A plus the norm of B. Uh, here we will insist on a fourth property, okay, and uh, the references basically vary, uh, you know, so some people actually do not consider this to be an essential part of the definition of a matrix norm, they, they like consider it as like sort of an additional feature, but here in this course we will assume that actually for something to qualify as a matrix norm, it should also be sub-multiplicative, not just sub-additive, it should be sub-multiplicative, which means that the norm of a product should be less than or equal to the product of norms. So uh, for vector norms, we have this guy. For the matrix norm, we have also this guy. Again, you, you know, the triangle inequality, uh, which means that basically the uh, norm is sub-additive, but we want it also to be sub-multiplicative. Um, you know, uh, the norm here that, you know, I assume that everyone knows is basically the Frobenius norm. Let's check that it is sub-multiplicative. Uh, so uh, let's uh, start with the, uh, the square of the Frobenius norm of the matrix product A times B. And uh, of course, they should have sizes that, uh, that match. Okay, so the number of columns in A should be equal to the number of rows in B. So that, I mean, AB makes sense. And uh, by definition of the Frobenius norm squared, basically what you do is that you go and take the elements of AB uh, and you take the magnitude square and then you sum over all those elements. And this will be the square of the Frobenius norm. Uh, now, element uh, JL in, in the product AB, how do you obtain it? You basically take the jth row, the jth row in A, and the lth column in B, and you multiply them together. So there is AJ1, AJ2, and up to AJL, and then there is a column here, which is B1L, B2L, I, and here we have B and L, and simply you do the multiplication, take this guy times this guy, plus this guy times the next guy, and so on. And so this is how we actually multiply matrices. Okay, and so this is the summation that gives you basically element AB, specifically element JL in, in the product AB. Uh, now we have the magnitude squared of a sum, so we'll apply the cauchy schwarz inequality. So the cauchy schwarz inequality tells you uh, that basically this guy is upper bounded by uh, the sum of the magnitude squares of those guys multiplied by the sum of the magnitude squares of those guys. Okay. Now, after applying the cauchy schwarz inequality, something very interesting happens, which is basically our four sums become separable. Okay, so you find here you have J, V, and you have here is J, and here is V. Okay, and so you can basically separate this from uh, basically the other sums. The other sums have indices L and K, and it's B, K, L. Okay, or, okay. so uh, you can separate basically the sums, and uh, each one of those sums is the square of the Frobenius norm of the respective matrix and you take the square root of both sides, then uh, uh, the Frobenius norm of AB is indeed less than or equal to the Frobenius norm of A multiplied by the Frobenius norm of B, okay? So the Frobenius norm is sub -multiplicated. Okay, any question? Uh, another, you know, uh, widely used, like sort of induced uh, uh, matrix norm is the induced matrix norm, which is a matrix norm that is derived using a vector norm. So your starting point is something that is well established as a vector norm, and then you uh, use it to define a to define a matrix norm. So uh, the word induced here, induced, it, it, it comes from it comes from a valid vector norm. Okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, so he, here I, I, I will pretend, I will pretend uh, that we don't know this result and actually we'll try to prove it from scratch, okay? So suppose that someone came to you and said, okay, we have a function G, and so G takes a matrix of dimension M by N, and it computes this function. So it will take basically, so there is some vector norm, okay? So you will basically do this, you will take AX, so A itself is a matrix, M by N, X is a vector N by 1, their product is a vector living in the M dimensional, uh, living in the M dimensional space, right? Uh, so you compute the vector norm of vector AX. 
then if x is not the all zero vector, then you can basically, uh, uh, you know, so if it's not the all zero vector, then the norm is not zero, and then you divide by the norm of x. Again, you are using the vector norm that you fix for uh, basically your uh, adventure here. Uh, and then you maximize over x, okay? So you find which x in the n-dimensional space will make this ratio as big as you can. Okay, so maximum x not equal to z, okay? And of course, you can see this is another, in another way. Uh, you know, the norm is, is, is just a scalar. So you can see this as a, and then you have x over the norm of x like this, okay? And so it's like you take a and you multiply by uh, x uh, divided by its norm. If you take a vector and divide it by its norm, uh, then basically you have a vector that has a unity norm, okay? So you can write down the definition of g of a, uh, which is this function that we are defining. Uh, it's this ratio with x uh, a non-zero vector, or basically it is uh, uh, the uh, vector norm applied to a uh, times x, uh, and uh, you basically here uh, concentrate on uh, vectors x that has a uh, unity vector norm. So, uh, so this is a function, again, you feed it a matrix and it will respond with a non-negative number, right? It's a non-negative number because by the end of the day, you'll compute a vector norm and, you know, a norm is non-negative. But is it a matrix? Is it a matrix norm? Okay. So, uh, before, before basically doing this investigation, we need an inequality. Um, uh, so, because g of a is defined as the maximum, okay, over vectors x like this, uh, then g of a, so again, g of a, so let's actually write it here, it's the maximum, okay, of a x over the norm of x for vectors x, you know, that are non-zero, okay. Uh, so, because it's the maximum, then it's greater than or equal to the vector norm applied to x divided by the vector norm applied to x for every x. We are executing, of course, x equals zero because we are dividing by the norm of x. Now, uh, multiply both sides by the vector norm of x. Okay, so you multiply, uh, basically, so we have g of a greater than or equal to a x, x, and then you just multiply by this guy. Okay, so if you multiply by, if you multiply by this guy, okay, you will get that uh, the vector norm, you know, applied to vector a x is less than or equal to g of a, this g of a, um, multiplied by uh, basically the uh, vector norm of x. Uh, and this inequality, so, so basically here we excluded, ex we excluded uh, x equals zero because, you know, we are dividing by the norm of x. But here actually, you know, even if we set x equals zero, this will be a valid inequality. It's, it's a valid for any non-zero x because of this. And um, if you would x equal if you would x equal zero, uh, then basically uh, you have a norm, uh, you know, uh, it, if x is the all zero vector, then uh, a times x will be the, an all zero vector with a zero uh, norm, okay? And so you get something like zero less than or equal to zero, which is a valid inequality, okay? So this is also true. So this is true for every x. Keep it in mind. We'll make use of it, okay? So again, function g of a, which is sort of, we are, pretty, you know, it, 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 it will turn out to be a matrix norm. We are pretending as if we are like basically trying to discover this. Uh, so g of a, g of a, uh, if you multiply it by the uh, a vector norm of x, uh, it is basically an upper bound on uh, the vector norm applied to matrix a multiplied by x, which is another. Okay, keep this in mind. So let's now verify whether this function g of a is a matrix norm. Okay. Uh, if you give me an all zero vector, okay, uh, sorry, if, if A is the all zero uh, matrix, if A is the all zero matrix, uh, then the all zero matrix multiplied by any vector will give you zero. So in the definition of G of A, this numerator will always be zero and you get a zero. Okay. But the challenge now is what if G of A is zero? I mean, remember that in the definition of uh, a matrix norm, it should be zero if and only if we are talking about the all zero matrix. So suppose that I give you a matrix A, you apply function G to this matrix and you get a zero. Are you sure that basically the matrix is the all zero matrix? And now this inequality will, will answer this question. So this inequality tell, you know, basically if G of A is equal to zero, this quantity on the left is a non-negative quantity because it's the vector norm. And so if a non-negative quantity is less than or equal to zero, then it is equal to zero. Then from the definition of a vector norm, a vector norm is equal to zero if and only if we are talking about the all zero vector. Okay, so if g of a is equal to zero, 
then this norm is equal to zero, then this AX is equal to zero for every X living in the N dimensional space. Okay, uh, so if it's equal to zero for all for all vectors x, uh, you know, so you can choose basically the standard basis vectors. Okay, so vector e j, e j here, uh, it's a vector in the n dimensional space with one in the jth position and zeros elsewhere. Uh, then a multiplied by e sub j uh, will be uh, will be the all zero vector. Which means that I mean, when you take a matrix A and you multiply it by a vector that looks like this with uh, zeros everywhere except in the jth position where you find an A, uh, what you get is basically A column G. You get the jth column of A, and so this will be equal to zero. And because this in, this is true for every X, okay, so it's true for E1, okay, uh, and it's true for E2, and it's true for E3, and so on, and each one of those guys will tell you, oh, the first column actually is all zero, and uh, the second column is all zero, the third column is all zero, and so forth. So, indeed, we have the all zero matrix. Okay, what is what about G of C? Uh, this is a scalar complex scalar C multiplied by A. Uh, again, uh, we are defining this G in terms of a vector uh, vector um, norm. Uh, and for vector norms, uh, basically, if you have this uh, C, uh, you can bring it outside as the magnitude of C. So this property will be inherited uh, from vector norms. What about uh, the triangle inequality? So G of A plus B, okay, by definition, will be uh, the maximum over all n-dimensional vectors of unity vector norm, uh, okay, and um, uh, then you have the matrix, so your matrix here is the sum of two matrices A plus B, okay, so uh, now you basically distribute, so this is AX plus BX, okay, so this is a vector in the m-dimensional space, this is another vector in the m-dimensional space, and again, don't, don't forget that this thing here is a valid vector norm, so for vector norms, they are sub-additive. They obey the triangle inequality. And so basically, this norm applied to the sum of these two guys will be less than or equal to the sum of each guy. Okay. And then we have this, we have this property here that basically the, uh, the um, um, you know, uh, so the, the maximum, the supremum of a sum is less than or equal to the sum of the sum of a supreme. Okay, so we have the maximum, the maximum of functions that are added together. This is less than or e this is less than or equal to the sum, you know, uh, the sum of supreme. And I, I think actually the proof of this uh, is um, uh, in the notes titled supremum and the infimum. So you'll find actually basically the, the proof that, you know, they have the maximum of these two things. It's less than or equal to the maximum of this plus the maximum of that, which is sort of intuitive. Because here we are finding x that maximizes the sum, but here we have basically the freedom because like we are doing maximizing this guy on its own and this guy on its own. So, you know, we can achieve something that is at least equal to the, what you achieve from here. Okay. Uh, and what is, what is this uh, thing here? It is uh, g of a. And what is this thing there? That's g of b. And so the function g is indeed sub-additive. Last thing, and then G will be accepted as a matrix norm, is to show that it is submultiplicative. Okay, so let's take G applied to AB, and so uh, by definition, you take the vector norm, and uh, you take AB and multiply by X, uh, and you, you maximize this quantity uh, for vectors X uh, such that their vector norm is unity. Uh, and so what you can do is that, you know, so have ABX, Okay, so uh, matrix multiplication is associative, and so, you know, basically this thing is as if you are doing Bx first, and then you multiply by A. And so this is a vector. Uh, and so remember, you know, remember basically the, uh, the inequality that we established uh, from the definition of G, which is this one here. Okay, so I will apply this inequality. Okay, so this inequality tells you that you take a matrix, you multiply by a vector, you apply the vector norm, uh, so it, this is always less than or equal to G of A, and multiplied by the normal vector, and again, this is because G of A is defined as a maximum, okay? Uh, so you apply this here, and so uh, this, um, uh, this basically, this uh, vector A, so our sort of matrix A multiplied by this vector Bx, uh, this will be less than or equal to G of A, G of A, uh, multiplied by basically the vector norm of Bx, okay? And the G of A is no longer dependent on X, 
and basically this maximum here is g of b this maximum here is g of b by definition and so uh, g of a b is less than or equal to g of a times g of b so indeed this function is submultiplicative it satisfies everything that we want uh, regard you know basically when uh, in a matrix norm so um, uh, uh, this is a matrix norm uh, and it's called the induced uh, it comes from a vector norm. a big any big any vector norm uh, of your choice and play this game and you will get a corresponding valid matrix norm and so the game is um, you take the vector you, you take the matrix you multiply it by the vector and then you apply the vector norm and then you divide by the norm of the vector, and so this uh, uh, assumes that the vector is non-zero, or basically you normalize the, the vectors to, uh, to have a vector norm of unity, and then you maximize. This will give you a valid uh, matrix norm. Uh, typically, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, this induced matrix norms uh, are applied when, for the vector norm, we choose, we choose the um, vector LB norms, okay? So the vector LB norm, LB norm, remember this thing here, uh, what is the vector LB norm? Uh, so uh, you take uh, the components of a vector, so if the vector is n-dimensional, you take xi, take the magnitude, you raise to the power p, and then you take the b root. Okay, so this is the LB vector norm. Okay, and uh, if you use the LB vector norm, uh, uh, you know, in this game, uh, you will basically get the LB matrix norm. Okay, so denoted again with this norm here, and then a subscript which is which is p, uh, and uh, those are basically uh, uh, you know the most widely used norms are basically uh, one, l1 norm, uh, l2 norm, and l infinity norm, and we will study them short. Okay, so uh, so p equals b equals one, two, and infinity. Those are basically the cases of the cases of interest. Any question? Okay, so uh, the, so the matrix L1 norm again it comes from solving this uh, from solving this um, optimization problem. Uh, so we take matrix A, uh, n by n, we multiply it by vector x, which is n by one, and then we apply now the L1 vector norm. Okay, this will you know uh, you can use any vector norm, but now we are specifically uh, using uh, the L1 norm of a vector, which is the sum of the magnitudes of uh, of vectors, right? So basically by definition. Uh, this L, uh, you know, this L1 norm is a uh, magnitude of x1 plus magnitude of x2 up to magnitude of xn. And this norm is very important. It is used in uh, data analysis and signal processing uh, because involving the L1 norm in optimization problems uh, tend to produce sparse solutions. So solutions that are basically, uh, you have a vector of certain dimensionality, most of its elements are zero and you have just a few non-zero components. So this will come, I mean, we will basically have sort of a flavor of sparse signal processing. Um, uh, you know, again, in practice, it usually involves the, L, uh, the L1 node. Okay, now we are, what we are doing is basically we are taking the, the vector L1 norm and we are uh, basically uh, converting it into a matrix L1 norm using basically this. Uh, and from the previous page, it is established that this is indeed a matrix norm that, you know, satisfies everything that we need. Okay, how, how, how can we solve this uh, optimization problem? So what is vector X that is actually the solution to this problem and what is exactly the maximum? Okay, so as you are as you are doing in homework one, you know optimization problems. You know sometimes you do not like solve them. You, you do not you know a, a calculus based optimization is good and fine and everything, but you know sometimes you can solve optimization problems using inequalities, using like so, sort of common sense and so on. You do not like, really need like to just uh, every now you know every time uh, you just go for the, like things like the KKT conditions and so on. So here we will solve that problem using, you know, inequalities. Let's see. So I will take basically this quantity here. Uh, so it's A multiplied by X, uh, and then we take the L1 norm. Uh, and so um, uh, what is this vector? So uh, matrix A is like A row 1, A row 2. You can think of it as a stack of rows, and we have M rows, okay? And uh, then we have the vector X, okay? 
And basically, uh, what you get here, I mean, so, so what is the matrix vector uh, product? So one way of thinking about it is that you take the first one, you multiply by x, so it's a row one, so which is a row vector, multiplied by x, which is a column vector, and then a row two and x add to a row n and x, okay? And so now, if you want to take the L, the vector L1 norm of this vector, what, do you, what, what should you do? You should take each component, take the magnitude, and then you sum over those guys. So it's summation j from 1 to m, the magnitude of a row jx. Okay. Uh, so what, what about this uh, product itself? What is a row j multiplied by x? Okay, so let's expand this. Uh, so this is... So we take the jth row, so this is aj1, aj2, up to ajn, and then may, uh, vector x, so this is an n-dimensional, uh, sorry, this is an n-dimensional guy, so this is x1, x2, up to xn. Okay, and uh, what you do is that, you know, so you take this guy times this guy, plus this guy times this guy, and so on. Uh, so basically, a rho j of x is the sum l from 1 to n, agl, x, l. Okay, so uh, till now we have equality. Okay, so this is basically uh, this expression here. Now uh, let's uh, use our first inequality, which is a triangle inequality. Okay, uh, triangle inequality for scalars, for scalars, right? So basically, uh, if you have a bunch of complex numbers, Z1, Z2, Z3, and you know, uh, those are uh, complex numbers, okay, then, uh, then you know that the magnitude of the sum of Zk is less than or equal to the uh, magnitude of the sum. Uh, sorry, the magnitude of the sum is less than or equal to the sum of magnitudes, like this. Okay, so we'll apply the triangle inequality, and uh, so this magnitude will go inside, and now we have an inequality, and this is what we have. And then we rewrite our double sum, so the sum over L, so these are the components of vector X, and then they are multiplied by uh, the summation J from 1 to M, and then AGL. Okay, L let's think about actually what this summation is. So the index of summation is j, and you can think of l as fixed, okay? So for a fixed l, okay, so given l, what are we doing? So this will be magnitude a1l plus a2l all the way to aml. So what are those guys? Those are the magnitudes of the elements of a living on the lth column, right? So, uh, so this summation uh, basically is, it's as if you take the Lth column in A, Lth column in A, so A1L, A2L, up to AML, and you take its L1 vector norm. Okay, you take its L1 vector norm, which means that, again, you take the magnitude of each guy, you sum them, and that's the, you know, the vector uh, norm of, the L1 vector norm of this column Okay, so we will do another upper bounding step. Okay, we'll do another upper bounding step. Um, but basically, so, so basically this quantity, it depends on L. So this depends on L. So it depends on which column you are talking about. So let's replace those guys. They are multiplied by non-negative quantities. So let's replace those guys by their maximum. Okay, so here what I will do is, you know, basically we have an upper bound. And each term of these is other bounded by the maximum over. So this is the maximum over. I think there is uh, there is a type B. So basically, this should be um, this should be L, right? So what you do is so this is L. So what you do is basically that uh, you sweep through the columns of matrix A. For each column, you compute uh, the vector L1 norm. And then this quantity here is the maximum. This quantity here is the maximum. Now, this quantity is no longer a function of L. It's no longer a function of L. Okay? And so we can, this is like sort of a constant that we can take outside. And then we have this summation here. And what is this summation here? This summation here alone is the L1 norm of vector x, which is set to 1. In our optimization problem, we are dealing with vectors x such that their L1 norm is equal to 1. Uh, so, basically, um, so basically what we, what we have here um, is, uh, what we have here is basically that the L1 norm of Ax 
of vector ax is less than or equal to uh, basically uh, the maximum l1 norm of a column of x uh, of a of matrix a the maximum l1 norm of a column in matrix a and so um, you know so you see this upper bound you know this upper bound is sort of it's independent of x okay it's independent of x uh, so, uh, uh, you know, our basically steps tell us that, you know, this quantity here and hence its maximum is always less than or equal to basically, again, the number given by the following procedure. You go to matrix A, you compute the L1 norm of each column, and then you pick the biggest guy, and this will be the upper bound. Okay, so in solving the optimization problem, now we know that this uh, objective is less than or equal to some quantity which depends only on the elements of A. Is this quantity the maximum? In other words, is this upper bound, is this upper bound achievable? So I talked about this shortly in the previous lecture. So here, you know, again, if you have a, a, a one-dimensional function, okay, so you have a function, let's say g of alpha, and it looks like this. You know, if you have an upper bound, so basically you say, oh, this function g of alpha is, is, uh, yes, we, we exactly, exactly. So we, we need to achieve the upper bound, which is exactly what you are saying. You must ask yourself, is there a vector x that will allow me to achieve this upper bound? Okay, so is the upper bound achievable? Achievable means exactly what the comment that we uh, saw right now, which is basically, can we have a vector x that will actually set this inequality with a strict equality. So here, here, here is the good news, uh, and it's based on the uh, understanding a matrix vector norm. What, what do you do? You know, it, it's something that I did on the previous page. What, what is a matrix times a vector? One way of thinking about it is basically that you form a linear combination of the columns of of the columns of the matrix by using the vector. So. Uh, Let's, let's choose vector x to be ek. So ek, remember, this is basically a vector in the n-dimensional space, zeros everywhere except in the kth position in which there is a one. Okay, so it's one in the kth position. And what happens when you multiply matrix A by this vector? It will give you the kth column. Okay, so A, ek is exactly A column k. It's the kth column in A. So what you can do is that you basically choose vector x to be ek. What, what is the L1 norm of vector x? What is the L1 norm of ek? Uh, the L1 norm of a vector, you just take the magnitudes and sum them. And so uh, ek, all zeros except the one here. And so basically this thing is a one. So if you set x equal to ek, you are fine. Right, because we are basically doing things um, uh, using vector x, you know, uh, with a unity L1 norm. And so if you choose x to be ek, uh, then it, it has a unity L1 norm. So that's fine. And then, so what k do you choose? Strategically, you choose it to match the column of the matrix, to match the column of the matrix with the greatest or the maximum L1 norm. Okay, so uh, so this is so x. So again, let, let's say let's say that you have a matrix of two columns. Okay, let's say one, two, three. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, and one. Let's say one, two, minus four, something like that. Okay, so uh, basically the upper bound, the upper bound is you. I mean, go and compute the L1 norm of this vector is one plus two plus three, which is uh, six. Okay. Uh, what is the L2 norm, uh, sorry, the L1 norm of this column? It is 1 plus 2 plus 4, so that's 7. So this upper bound, this upper bound is uh, basically, is basically 7. So what you do is that, what if you multiply the matrix by a vector that is 0, 1? So you choose the one strategically to be, to correspond to the second column. So if you multiply this by this vector, which has a uh, unity L1 norm, what you get is 1, 2, minus 4. And what is the L1 norm of this vector? It is 1 plus 2 plus absolute value of minus 4, which is 4, and so you get a 7. So indeed, this upper bound here is achievable. Okay, and the optimal solution is basically vector x 
uh, with the one in a, posi in, the, in a particular position, a position that corresponds to the column of A with the maximum L1. Okay, so uh, so this is basically this is basically the um, uh, the L1 norm for a matrix. So the L1 norm for a matrix uh, is uh, according to how we define it. Um, it's it's an induced matrix norm uh, using the L1 norm of a vector, uh, and you know uh, to get the induced that matrix norm, we need to solve an optimization problem. Turns out that our optimization problem really is solvable. We can solve it. And actually, we have a closed form for the matrix L1 norm. And the closed form is simply that you basically sweep through the n columns of matrix A for each column. OK, so this summation here is nothing but the L1 norm of column V. For each column, you compute the vector L1 norm. And the biggest guy will be the L1 norm of the matrix. OK, so. Uh, what if uh, we want uh, the L infinity norm? Okay, so basically we define A L infinity. This will be the maximum of X infinity equals one. Okay, and uh, then we have A X infinity. So use here the L infinity norm of a vector. And the L infinity norm of a vector is basically the maximum magnitude in the vector. The maximum magnitude in the vector. So you basically, you sweep through the elements of the vector, uh, you compute the magnitude of each guy, and the maximum magnitude is the L infinity norm of the vector. So uh, uh, I, I will leave the details uh, to the notes. Uh, basically, you can do steps that are not very far from what uh, uh, we did here. And you can show that if we change our um, optimization problem and we actually use the L infinity, the L infinity norm, uh, then basically we can also solve the optimization problem and uh, it, its result is this thing here. Okay, so it is summation j from 1 to n magnitude of a v j. So, okay, so and then v goes from 1 to m. So, so basically what we are doing here is that we take color and sorry we take row uh, v so av1 av2 up to avn and what we do is that we take magnitude av1 plus magnitude av2 uh, plus magnitude avn so here we are computing the l1 vector norm of each row and then we pick the maximum Okay, so it, it turns out the L infinity induced norm for a matrix, the L infinity induced norm, is that you go to the matrix, okay, you go to the matrix, and you go to each row. So rather than each column for the L1, for L infinity, you go to each row, you compute the vector L1 norm of each row, which is the sum of the magnitudes, and then you pick the maximum, and this will be the L infinity norm. So, uh, you know, just by, you know, uh, by knowing that this final result, again, its derivation is like above. Um, uh, what is, you know, sometimes it's like sort of easier to like, uh, you know, wh what is the L infinity norm uh, of matrix A? Okay, sometimes it is useful to write it as the L1 norm of matrix A transpose or A Hermish, right? So A transpose or A Hermish. Uh, taking the complex conjugate of the elements will not change will not change the norm, right? Because you take magnitudes and so on, okay? And so sometimes you know it, it can facilitate your problems, you know, uh, basically to do this you, right? because like the L infinity norm, you basically go to the go to the rows, go to the rows and find the vector L1 norm of each row, then pick the maximum. Uh, so if you this is exactly as if you are computing the L1 norm of A transpose. Okay, because so L1 norm, you do it to columns, L infinity, you do it to rows. Okay. L2 induced norm. So what is the L2 induced norm for a, uh, for a matrix? Turns out, again, that this optimization problem can be solved. So now let's have our guys um, have a unity. Uh, so X now has a unity L2 norm. And this is uh, the L2 norm of vector AX. Okay, so uh, this is by definition of the induced norm, and so uh, you can just, you know, this is a, a non-negative quantity, you can just square it. And so what is AX, what is the L2 norm squared of AX? So this is AX Hermitian multiplied by AX, and so this will be X Hermitian, A Hermitian, AX. 
and so this is the maximum okay and then we we have a very important inequality okay extremely important inequality that if you have a matrix uh, let's say c is hermitian this is something that you should always keep in mind uh, for a hermitian matrix for a hermitian matrix c okay it's always it's always the case that uh, uh, you know that x hermitian c x is less than or equal to lambda 1 of c x hermitian x and is greater than or equal to lambda okay so let's say that it's uh, of size k by k so uh, lambda k of c uh, x hermitian x okay so if i have a hermitian matrix a hermitian matrix it must be square okay then the the quadratic form involving the uh, matrix c so x hermitian c x uh, there are basically lower bounds and upper bounds on this quadratic form so basically the upper bound is x hermitian x which is so this thing here is nothing but the l to norm squared of vector x multiplied by the maximum eigenvalue of c okay and uh, basically the lower bound is the l to norm squared of x multiplied by multiplied by the minimum eigenvalue of x it's very important very important inequality okay so uh, so a hermitian a is a hermitian matrix and so uh, basically this quantity x hermitian a hermitian a of x uh, this is upper bounded by the maximum eigenvalue of a hermitian a and uh, you multiply by the l to norm squared of vector x well i mean here we are talking about normalized vectors okay and so basically the l to norm, l to norm squared of vector x is one okay uh, now if you if you remember the previous lecture basically how did we obtain how did we obtain the singular values of a matrix conceptually not in practice but conceptually what we do is that we start with let's say a hermitian a right if you want the singular values of a you do a hermitian a the very first step in the derivation of the singular value decomposition was okay you know matrix a can be rectangular and you know or even if it's a square it can be uh, non-diagonalizable it can be defective uh, but what you can do is um, what you can do is uh, basically you uh, can write you can write down a hermitian a because it's a square right it's square it's n by n and it is um, hermitian and it is actually positive semi-definite okay and then you do eigen decomposition to this thing here so it was like v and then you know sigma squared v hermitian something like that and so uh, the eigenvalues of this matrix uh, were considered the squares of the singular values of a uh, or uh, actually it's the other way around so basically uh, the eigenvalues that we obtained here taking their square roots by definition become the singular values of matrix a itself Okay, so the maximum eigenvalue of A Hermitian A will be the square, the square of the maximum singular value of matrix A. Now take the square root of both sides. Okay, so uh, so now we have basically this inequality. Okay. Sigma one of sigma one of A. Right, so we have we have basically this uh, we have this uh, this inequality, okay, and uh, uh, basically um, again I didn't I, I didn't write it here because like I assume that it is known that okay let's go back to our Hermitian matrix inequality okay not bad actually to mention it explicitly okay so again uh, you have a Hermitian matrix a quadratic form involving the Hermitian matrix like what we have here is our bounded by the maximum eigenvalue multiplied by the l to norm squared of this vector x and lower bounded by the uh, minimum eigenvalue uh, are those bounds achievable uh, can you make the quadratic form uh, equal to equal to this upper bound and can you make this quadratic form exactly equal to the lower bound exactly eigenvectors so basically, uh, you achieve the upper bound. So, so this is the maximum eigenvalue. You achieve the upper bound by choosing vector x to be to be the eigenvector uh, associated with or corresponding to the maximum eigenvalue. And same story here. So basically, vector x, you choose vector x to be uh, basically the vector corresponding or associated with the minimum eigenvalue of the matrix. So, uh, so here, uh, basically, the optimal x, so optimal x, 
will be optimal x eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1 of a Hermitian e. And so what is this eigenvector? It has a name. It's V1. It's the first column of matrix V. Okay, it's it's the first column of matrix V, right? Because it's matrix V is basically uh, the matrix containing its co the columns of matrix V are basically the uh, eigenvectors of A Hermitian A. Okay, so uh, so this is the L2 norm of a matrix. So it is the maximum singular value of a matrix. It's the maximum singular value of a matrix. And some people rather than using L2 norm, you you also in the literature you see spectral norm. So if, if you read the spectral norm of a matrix, it is basically the uh, L2 norm, uh, and this is the maximum, uh, the maximum um, singular value of the matrix. Okay, so uh, remember from last time, uh, the Frobenius norm, so the Frobenius norm is uh, basically the sum of the squares of the singular values, sigma r squared, right? And now we know another norm, so the L2 norm, and it is equal to sigma 1. And it is always the case, you know, just by comparing, it is always the case that the Frobenius norm is greater than or equal to the, uh, the L2 norm of the matrix. Uh, the norms, you know, there are so many uh, inequalities involving matrix norms, uh, as uh, you may have encountered earlier in your lives uh, regarding vector norms. So many inequalities, so let, let's, let me give you a flavor of these. So for vectors, uh, for vectors we basically have, uh, you know, this very uh, famous inequality, the nested uh, LP space inequality, uh, which is that if you have uh, vectors, okay, and actually uh, those can be infinite dimensional vectors uh, so long as basically the norms are uh, finite. Uh, so if, if Q is less than or equal to B, then the LB norm of the vector is less than or equal to the LQ norm. Okay, so the LB norm, okay, so here B is greater than Q. So the LB norm is less than or equal to the LQ norm. And the LQ norm itself is less than or equal to the LB norm multiplied by the dimensionality, which is K for vector K, uh, and, then, uh, and then raised to some power, and this power is basically uh, 1 over Q. Uh, minus 1 over p. Okay, so this is a very famous, very famous inequality. And, uh, you know, we'll just take it for granted. If you choose b equals, uh, b equals infinity, so b infinity and uh, q equals 2, so uh, the L infinity norm is less than or equal to uh, the L2 norm of the vector. And then uh, if you put, if you put uh, q equals 2, and b equals infinity, then this will be k, the dimension raised to the power 1 over 2, that's the square root. So it's always the case that, um, that basically the L2 norm is less than or equal to the square root of k multiplied by the L infinity norm. By the way, you know, proving this is, you know, you, you can, you, you don't need actually this thing. Actually, this is, uh, I think this inequality is like so obvious because, um, you know, uh, so the L2, the L2 norm is this thing, x1 squared, uh, up to xn squared, so definitely this is greater than or equal to, okay, uh, the maximum magnitude, right? So the maximum over k, you know, over j, j from one to n xj, okay? Because basically here we are uh, we are uh, taking all the components, all the components in the vector, but here we just take the maximum, and uh, you know, if you upper bound each component by the maximum, then this is less than or equal to square root of the number of components. So if it's n, so it's n, and then the l infinity uh, norm squared. And so this will be uh, less than the square root of the dimensionality, the l infinity. Okay, so you can basically, like, rather than using the general form, you can basically uh, um, convince yourself uh, from uh, the definition of l2 norm and l infinity norm for vectors that this inequality is indeed true. And so if you think the reciprocal, so assuming that basically we are talking about a uh, non-zero uh, non vector x, uh, then you take the reciprocal, so 1 over the L infinity norm is greater than or equal to 1 over the L2 norm, uh, which would be greater than or equal to 1 over the square root of the dimensionality, 1 over the L infinity norm. Okay? And, so, um, and so from here we can also say that the reciprocal of the L infinity norm is upper bounded by the square root of the dimensionality divided by the L2 norm. 
Okay. So uh, suppose that again you are, you, you know, and they, like, this is like a famous exercise find it in many books, and you know, basically those uh, the matrix rule inequalities. And so, for example, can we establish sort of some, um, you know, inequalities between uh, the induced L2 norm and the induced uh, L infinity norm? Yes. So, um, so he, he, here is one way of doing it. Uh, so take the L2 norm of AX divided by the L2 norm of X. So this this is not this is not the the L to norm of the matrix, right? So if you maximize if you maximize this thing over X, then you obtain the L to norm of the matrix, which we now know it's actually the maximum singular value of the matrix. Okay, so uh, so L to norm over L to norm, upper bound each one by uh, a norm involving uh, basically uh, so uh, upper bound each one by an L infinity norm. Okay, so. Uh, okay, let, let's write it like this. So uh, I will write this as a product. So here is the L term of the vector, and then we have this one. Okay, so from here, we know that the 1 over the L2 norm is upper bounded by 1 over the L infinity norm. Okay, and uh, basically the L2 norm itself, the L2 norm itself, is can be upper bounded by the L infinity norm, Okay, can be upper bounded by the L infinity norm, but you need to multiply by the square root of the dimensionality. Okay, so what is the dimension of this vector? AX is a vector living in the M dimensional space. So the L2 norm of vector AX is upper bounded by the square root of M, because that's the dimension of the vector AX, multiplied by the L infinity norm of AX. So here we have a ratio of L2 norms we can upper bound it by a ratio of L infinity norms, and then we will get this basically factor here, which is as a square root of M, the number of rows in matrix A. Now, uh, now if you have, if you have basically, uh, if you have basically uh, a, a something less than or equal to something, then you can take the maximum of both sides, okay? And if you take the maximum of both sides, well, if you take the maximum of this side over non-zero vectors, you will get the L2 norm of the matrix, which is it, you know, its maximum singular value. And if you if you take the if you uh, obtain the maximum of the right-hand side, uh, you will you will obtain the L infinity norm of the matrix, which again, remember, it is uh, how how do you obtain it? You uh, you divide the matrix into rows. You compute the L the vector L1 norm of each row, and then you pick the maximum. Okay, and uh, so so again, you know, I, I did something that you know I you know I assume that you know that uh, basically if you have an inequality, right, uh, you, you can take the maximum or supremum of both sides. Okay, uh, let me see if I can do it. Uh, so, so suppose that you have function f of alpha is uh, always uh, less than or equal to g of alpha uh, for every alpha li living in some you know subset uh, of you know say, say that alpha is an um, n-dimensional um, uh, space, so, you know, let's take a subset. Uh, the inequality is, the inequality is for the same x, but it is, it is true, the inequality is true for every non-zero x. The inequality is true for every non-zero x. So it will be true if you take the maximum of both sides with relative to x. Okay, let me try to convince you, you know, hopefully I, I will get it correctly, most likely I will get it wrong, but let's see. Okay, um, so f of, suppose that you have a function f of alpha, okay, so f of alpha and alpha lives in, like, so basically alpha in the m n dimension space, okay, uh, or c, you know, complex value. Okay. Uh, so this is true for every alpha living in a subset of the n dimension space. So is it valid that, so this is true for every alpha, so you basically, you compute the function f, uh, uh, for every alpha, and it is less than or equal to g of alpha. Now, is it the case that the supremum alpha in omega, f of alpha, uh, less than or equal to the supremum of alpha in omega, g of alpha? Is this true? Okay, so uh, so this is the claim uh, that actually you can you can apply a supremum to mo to both sides or maximum, if you know. Um, so let's call this guy A. Let's call this guy B. So it is required that we show that A is less than or equal to B. So uh, so suppose uh, by way of contradiction, okay. So let's do a proof by contradiction. Uh, suppose by way of contradiction that uh, that A is actually uh, greater than B. So suppose by way of contradiction that basically this supremum is greater than is greater than the supreme. 
Okay. Now, um, uh, for every epsilon, I mean, from the definition of supremum, for every epsilon greater than zero, right, uh, there exists a, an alpha tilde living in, you know, this uh, uh, omega, uh, such that uh, f of f of uh, alpha tilde, of course, f of alpha tilde is uh, less than or equal to less than or equal to a, right? Because this is the supremum of the function. So by definition, f of alpha tilde is less than or equal to a. But uh, for every epsilon greater than zero, there is a specific, you know, you know, perhaps it's not unique, but at least you can find one alpha tilde such that f of alpha tilde is greater than greater than a minus epsilon. And this is true for every epsilon because if this is if this is not satisfied, uh, then a is not the supremum. Remember that a is not just an upper bound. The supremum of a set is not just an upper bound on the set. It's the least upper bound. So if it's the least upper bound, then it must be the case that uh, that for every epsilon greater than zero, you can find an alpha tilde in big omega such that f of alpha tilde is greater than the supremum minus this positive quantity. Okay. Now. Uh, choose okay so uh, so here set I mean uh, this is this is true for every epsilon that is positive so set epsilon we can choose a um, some epsilon a specific uh, epsilon value that basically will help us uh, solve the problem uh, which is under our assumption that is greater than b then a minus b is a positive quantity so set epsilon equal to a minus b over two which is a positive quantity so it's valid okay and so this will be a minus a minus b over two. And so this will be a plus b over two, and our assum our you know given our assumption here, uh, a is greater than b, so this is greater than b plus b over two, and so this will this is equal to b. This is equal to b, and what is b? B is the supremum of uh, the g function, and so this is greater than or equal to. Uh, G of alpha tilde, right? So if you evaluate G at alpha tilde, you know, because this is the supremum, then it is less than. So now what we have is the following. There exists alpha tilde uh, in big omega such that, such that uh, F of alpha tilde is strictly greater than G of alpha tilde contradiction, right? Contradiction because uh, we assumed initially that basically uh, for every alpha in big omega, f of alpha is less than or equal to g of alpha, okay? So, uh, you know, you don't need like, to do things from scratch every time. Uh, if, you have, if you have an inequality that is valid, you know, valid for every, you know, uh, over some subset, uh, you know, or over some domain, uh, then basically you can take the maximum or the supremum of both sides. And uh, this is basically what we did here. Okay. Uh, of course, you can take infimum uh, or, may, or minimization. And the only thing is that uh, so if you, if you have f of alpha uh, less than or equal to g of alpha for every alpha and something. Now, if you take uh, so, let's suppose that your starting point is a strict inequality. If it's a strict inequality, uh, please if you if you take infimum or supremum to convert it into uh, an inequality with possible equality. Okay, so uh, so this will be supremum, let's say, f of alpha less than or equal to supremum g of alpha. Okay, or, uh, or infimum uh, f of alpha less than or equal to infimum g of alpha. Okay, uh, and the same applies also if you take limits on both sides. So basically limit uh, alpha tends to alpha zero of f of alpha less than or equal to limit uh, alpha tends to alpha zero of g of alpha. So you can take, you can do these operations, supremum, infimum, maximum, minimum, uh, or limit. Uh, but if you start with a strict inequality, I mean, uh, you should uh, have it like this because sometimes, um, so uh, like the most straightforward uh, uh, like uh, example is, uh, you know, uh, one plus one over n, one plus one over n is uh, is strictly uh, greater than one minus one over n for every natural number n. Right, so this is a strictly inequality for every natural number n. However, if you take the limit of both sides, you have limit n tends to infinity one plus one over n, uh, and limit n tends to infinity of one minus one over n. Well, that's one and that's one. Okay, that's one and that's one. So, so for every n, for every natural number n or positive integer, this is a strict inequality. However, if you take the limit, the limit point of the sequence is the same as the limit point of that sequence. 
And so, uh, yeah, so again, uh, if you start with the strict inequality and you take supremum, infimum, maximum, minimum, or take the limit of both sides as the parameter goes to some, you know, some uh, value, uh, then convert the strict inequality to, uh, to basically an inequality with the possibility of, of equality. Uh, we can play the same thing. Um, you know, you start with a ratio involving the L-infinity norms. Okay, and then you use the inequalities above uh, to, to have upper bounds using the L2 norms, and then you take the maximum of both sides, and this will give you that basically the L infinity norm of A is less than or equal to square root N, uh, the L2 norm of A. Now, why do we have a square root N here? Uh, because, because, the, you know, because of this step. So here, 1 over x, 1 over the L infinity norm is less than or equal to the square root of the dimensionality of x. Okay, so here, x is so m a is m by n x is n by one and so basically you have square root n here okay so uh, here you get m here you get n and you can combine both inequalities like this okay so this is uh, basically uh, uh, an inequality relating the uh, induced l2 norm and the induced l infinity norm and you cannot uh, use these ideas like to derive so many inequalities any question So spectral radius is not a norm, okay? So spectral radius is something also that you apply just to square matrices, but it's, it is related to norms, it is related to norms, uh, it is used like, you know, uh, later, you know, later we will study the Biron fropenius theorem, and so uh, basically uh, in that we will use the term spectral radius, and it is also used uh, in, uh, in the topic of Markov chains, okay? So uh, it's nice basically to understand what, is, what uh, uh, the spectral radius is, and uh, how it how uh, it is related to matrix norms. So uh, it is only for square matrices, it is not a norm, and uh, simply uh, the spectral radius of a square matrix is that you go and, co uh, and obtain the eigenvalues of the matrix, uh, the maximum magnitude, that's the spectral radius of the matrix. So, you know, suppose that you have matrix A, if you have the eigenvalues, suppose that the eigenvalues of matrix A are, you know, one, uh, one half, uh, one plus i, you know, general matrix uh, complex. Okay, then, uh, then the spectral radius of A will be. Uh, so this guy is the magnitude is one. The magnitude of one half is one fourth. One plus i is square root two. So basically, the spectral radius of A will be square root two. Okay. Um, now let's try to establish a relation between uh, the spectral uh, the spectral radius of a square matrix and uh, norms. So suppose that the matrix is, you apply to it some norm you know who knows l infinity norm l2 norm and so on so uh, take uh, lambda and q to be an eigen pair of matrix a uh, so uh, by definition uh, a q is equal to lambda q now apply apply a matrix norm uh, to both sides. Uh, here we are treating we are treating a vector as a, you know a, a vector uh, in some sense is a special case of a matrix, right? So it is just you know that one of the uh, you know a column vector is a, a, is something by one, right? So uh, so yes, I mean you can apply matrix norm to a vector. So uh, apply matrix norm to both sides, okay? And this is this is a scalar, and so uh, by the properties of a norm. Uh, you can big, you have it outside as a magnitude, like this. Okay, so apply matrix norm. Uh, now, um, now matrix norms, uh, you know, uh, in, are designed to be submultiplicative, uh, which means that the uh, the norm uh, applied to a product of two matrices uh, is less than or equal to uh, the norm of the first you know, first matrix times the norm of the second matrix. Uh, by definition, an eigenvector of the matrix is a non-zero vector. So if it's a non-zero vector, then uh, the norm uh, is non-zero, and you can divide both sides by uh, the norm of Q, and so you are left with uh, the magnitude of lambda is less than or equal to uh, basically um, the norm applied to matrix A. And if this is true for every lambda, I mean, uh, 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 did we choose any particular lambda here? This is true for every lambda, right? So the maximum of lambda j, you know, j, you know, basically, so if you, if you do this for any, for any eigenvalue of the matrix, uh, this will be uh, upper bounded by uh, uh, a matrix norm. And hence, 
the spectral radius of a matrix, is, you know, again, it's concept just f uh, for square matrices, is our bounded by any matrix norm. Okay, so you have a square matrix, uh, go and compute its spectral radius. So how do we do this? Again, conceptually, not in practice. Uh, what you do is that you do eigen, you know, you do eigen decomposition for the matrix, you know, and you obtain its eigenvalues. You just need to the eigenvalues of the matrix, and uh, you compute the magnitudes, and you pick the maximum, so this will be the spectral, uh, the spectral radius, you know, the spectral radius. Now, uh, I, I, I said spectral radius. A spectral norm is a valid norm, it's the L2 norm, okay? Uh, this is spectral radius. On the, on the other hand, you compute a norm. So this norm can be anything. So this norm here can be the spectral norm, which is this one here, which is the maximum singular value. It can be the L1 norm, it can be the Frobenius norm, okay? It can be any norm. And it will always be the case that the spectral radius is less than or equal to the matrix norm. For every matrix norm, okay, for any matrix norm. Uh, interesting, okay. Um, so, now, the eigenvalues of a squared matrix uh, are very related to the eigenvalues of the matrix raised to some power. Right, so, uh, so if you have a matrix A, A to the power K, what are the eigenvalues of A to the power K? So if the eigenvalues of A are lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and so on, the eigenvalues of A to the power K are lambda 1 to the K, lambda 2 to the K, lambda 3 to the K, and so on. Just take the Kth powers of uh, basically the eigenvalues of A. Okay, and so uh, we know that for complex numbers, for complex numbers, so if you, if you had a complex number and uh, you, you, you take it, uh, you raise it to the power k and then take the magnitude, it's the same as uh, taking the magnitude and raise it to the power k. Okay, so, uh, so rho of a to the power k, rho to, so basically, what, what is this thing? You, you obtain the eigenvalues of a to the k and then uh, compute the magnitudes and then you pick up the maximum. This is exactly equal to rho, rho of a, the spectral radius raised to the power k. Why? Because rho of a itself, rho of a itself, it's the maximum magnitude, and then you raise it to the power k. And again, for a complex number, suppose that you have a complex number w, right? So w is a magnitude and a phase, right? So, uh, so if you take w to the power k and then take magnitude, it's the same as, same as basically uh, raising this thing uh, to the power, you know, to the power k and then taking the magnitude, right? Um, then, okay, so, so we have here that rho a, a to the power k is exactly equal to rho of a to the k. But then we, we know now that the spectral radius of any matrix is less than or equal to a sum matrix norm applied to the matrix. Okay, so uh, let's write it another way. So we have rho a to the power k. Yes, sir. Rho of a to the power k, like this. Okay. So again, from the previous argument, this is our bounded by any matrix norm applied to the matrix. And because of the definition of the spectral radius and how the eigenvalues of uh, the kth power of a matrix are just the eigenvalues of the matrix itself raised to the power k, then we know that this is equal to uh, rho of a to the k. Then, so we have this inequality here, and uh, raise both sides to the power 1 over k, and so, uh, so the spectral radius of a matrix is upper bounded by this. It's, it's not just it's upper bounded by uh, a matrix norm applied to the matrix, it's upper bounded by the case uh, root of a matrix norm applied to a to the power k. So this is true for every natural number k and also for every a matrix norm. So this matrix norm, it can be anything of your choice. And this k can be any natural number. And it will always be true that the spectral radius is our bounded by this nice quantity. Okay. So in fact, um, there is a nice uh, theorem that if you take the limit of both sides, you know, uh, so basically this thing does not depend on k. So if you take the limit of the left-hand side as k tends to infinity, it's, it's just the same thing. 
uh, if you take the limit escape goes to infinity, actually you get equality. Equality. It is you get equality guaranteed. So this is called Gelfand's uh, theorem or formula. Uh, a very, a very nice and elegant result. Okay. So, so we want like to prove it. So we want to prove that basically, uh, if you take this quantity for any matrix norm, for any matrix norm, if you basically uh, uh, apply the norm to uh, the kth power of the matrix and then uh, raise to the power one over k then as k tends to infinity, this thing will, uh, will uh, basically approach uh, rho v, the spectral radius of the limit. So to do this, we need like a piece of information, uh, which is, suppose that you have a square matrix, okay, and, uh, you know, you have basically successive powers of the matrix. Uh, so uh, here is a theorem. If you take a, matrix, a square matrix A, you raise it to some power, and then you take the limit as n goes to infinity. Okay, then the limit is the all zero matrix. The limit is the all zero matrix if and only if the spectral radius of matrix A is strictly less than one. So you have a matrix, and then you have you know powers. You know what if you increase the power without bound? You just increase the power. Will you converge? Of course, you may not converge to anything. You may not converge to anything. Uh, perhaps the elements of A to the power M as N gets large uh, will basically ex explode. But if basically the spectral radius is strictly less than 1, then A to the power M will converge to the all zero matrix as N goes to infinity and vice versa. If you have a matrix, you raise it to the power M and you discover that as m goes to infinity, your matrix A to the m approaches the all zero matrix, you are sure that uh, rho of A, the spectral radius of A, is strictly less than one. Okay, very nice theorem. Uh, a partial proof is in the notes. Uh, and the reason is that uh, uh, the partial proof that you, I, I said, you know, uh, partial, uh, because in the notes, I assumed that A is diagonalizable. So I proved actually this thing, uh, but assuming that A is diagonalizable, uh, which makes the proof like sort of, uh, you know, uh, very straightforward. Um, uh, but actually the theorem applies also if A is non-diagonalizable. Uh, and in that case, you simply use the Jordan canonical form. Okay, so uh, again, like if you want like the key at least to have, yeah. Is the spectral, if the spectral equal to the spectral uh, norm? Uh, no, no. The spectral radius, so the spectral norm is a norm, so the spectral radius, it, we, we, the only thing that is guaranteed, spectral radius is less than or equal to the spectral norm because it is less than or equal to any matrix norm. Okay, and so spectral norm is basically sigma one of the matrix. Okay. Um, I think maybe there, there will be like a problem in coming homework, which like you have a case in which like you have a spectral radius equal to one of the norms or something like this. Okay. Um, so let's now try to uh, prove uh, Gelfand's uh, basically a relation uh, or formula, which is uh, that, uh, you know, that, you know, if you take a matrix to the power V and then you take the Vth root, uh, this we have equality. Is the proof. So you start with the matrix A, uh, and it has a spectral radius, which is rho of A. Okay, so you will basically work with uh, a modified matrix. So you take matrix A, and you multiply matrix A by a scalar. Okay, so this is just a scalar. And what is the scalar? The scalar is 1 over the spectral radius of matrix A plus some positive epsilon. Okay, so you have a matrix A, you can compute its spectral radius. Okay, you get a number. Okay, you get a number, you just add to this number an epsilon, which is a strictly positive. And then uh, now you have a new matrix, which is A multiplied by one over rho of A plus epsilon. Right? So uh, when you multiply a matrix by scalar, 
uh, what happens to the eigenvalues of the matrix, right? So if you have the matrix A, eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and so on, what about matrix alpha A? What are, you know, basically, if you just scale the matrix by scalar, right? So alpha, lambda 1, alpha, lambda 2, alpha. So this is one, you know, of the uh, things, you know, so you have AQ is equal to lambda Q. If you multiply both sides by alpha, then alpha AQ is equal to alpha lambda Q. So a matrix in which like, you scale it by just a scalar, it means that this basically the eigenvalues will take this scalar uh, power. You know, it will, they will be multiplied by the scalar. And now what you are doing, so matrix A itself, it, ha it has a spectral radius. So this is the maximum magnitude. You divide it not just by rho of A, but rho of A plus a positive quantity. So the spectral radius of this matrix is less than 1. Okay, so what is the spectral radius of... 1 over rho of A plus epsilon A. So this is A divided by a scalar. Well, you know, it will be, this is a, a real valued positive quantity. So this will be 1 over rho of A plus epsilon uh, multiplied by the spectral radius of A. And so we have rho of A divided by rho of A plus epsilon. So this is something that is strictly less than unity. So a nice trick. So you start with a matrix with an arbitrary spectral radius take it divided by the spectral radius plus a positive quantity. Now you have a matrix with a spectral radius that is strictly less than 1. By the theorem that we, uh, we took for granted, um, now if you take this matrix with a spectral radius that is strictly less than 1, if you raise it to the power v and you take the limit as v goes to infinity, you converge to the all zero matrix. Okay, what is the meaning? What is the meaning of this? So what is the meaning of this limit? What is the meaning of this limit? Okay, and um, especially when uh, we will come to convergence of random variables, uh, sometimes it's really crucial uh, to go back to the very definition of a limit. Okay, so sometimes actually it is better to do things using the, so you need to, you know, so limits are not just L'Hopital, you know, or just using software. Sometimes you, you, you basically you go back to the very definition of a limit. Sometimes you, the problem cannot be solved otherwise, okay? So uh, if you have this limit here, uh, it means the following. It means that for every uh, delta greater than zero, for every positive delta, there is a big N. There is a big N. Okay, and big N will basically depend on depend on delta, this delta here, and depend on the epsilon that we have chosen above, okay, which is this positive epsilon. So there exists a big N that depends on both your choice for delta and your choice of big epsilon, such that whenever this V, whenever this V exceeds big N, whenever V, which you take to infinity, exceeds big N, you actually have a matrix norm applied to the difference between this quantity and this quantity can be made less than delta. I mean, so this is exactly the definition of a norm. I mean, limit means that the, the distance between these two things, okay, so distance can be made arbitrarily small by choosing um, a v large enough. Right? This is the meaning of this limit statement, that the distance, okay, distance uh, between the, the candidate limit, now you know, here we know that it's the limit, zero, the all zero matrix, and basically this quantity, can be made arbitrarily small, so we can make it smaller than any positive delta of our choice, uh, so long as we choose V to be large enough, okay, which is this thing. So for every delta greater than uh, zero, there exists a big N such that for every V that is greater than big N, uh, we have a matrix norm, uh, you know, uh, of the difference, so that's the distance I'm talking about, uh, is, uh, can be made arbitrarily small. What matrix norm do you use? Um, for vectors for and matrices, basically uh, any any norm will 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 is okay. Any norm is okay. Now uh, this is true for every delta. 
So it is true for delta equals one or any number. So you can put delta equals one half, uh, uh, pi minus one, anything of your choice. So uh, so this means, and of course it's true for any it's true for any uh, for any positive epsilon that you choose again to do this trick of uh, of having the matrix with a spectral radius that is strictly less than one. So. Um, so now we have for every epsilon greater than zero, there, there exists an n, okay, and now n again generally is a function of is a function of delta and epsilon. Now we fix delta at one. So there exists an n uh, that now depends on epsilon because we fix delta at one such that for every small v, uh, small v greater than big M, we have again this matrix norm applied to the difference and of course anything minus the all zero matrix is the thing itself okay so i mean if you don't like it i mean there is here minus zero n by n okay so uh, the matrix norm applied to the difference can be made less than can be made less than one okay or you can set a delta to any positive number of your choice and uh, here it is basically uh, you know for the rest of the groups basically one will do uh, will do the trick of showing this required this required result here uh, okay, uh, so uh, so the matrix so the matrix norm. Uh, this is just this is just a scalar. Uh, so uh, we can take it outside, and uh, this will be the matrix norm applied to a to the power v. So for v large enough, the matrix norm of a to the v. So for uh, uh, large sufficiently sufficiently large V, uh, the matrix norm applied to AV is less than uh, rho of A plus epsilon raised to the power V. Just move this uh, this to the other side. And take, um, take the Vth root of both sides. So raise uh, both sides to the uh, power one over V. And so you get this. So you get basically that uh, the L to norm of, uh, sorry, you get the any matrix, I, 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 not just the L2 norm, it, it can be any matrix norm. The matrix uh, norm applied to A to the V uh, uh, and then raised to the power 1 over V is uh, less than uh, rho of A plus uh, epsilon. Okay. So uh, let, let's put this here. So um, A V uh, to the 1 over V is less than rho A. Uh, but from the previous page, from the previous page, we um, we know something. We know that basically this quantity here is an upper bound. It's an upper bound on the spectral radius of matrix A. Regardless of regardless of your norm, and basically for any natural number or positive integer v, uh, this is lower bounded by the spectral radius. And of course, the spectral radius is. Uh, greater than the spectral radius minus some arbitrary positive quantity. Okay, so now we have this nice uh, inequality. So we have basically that rho of a minus epsilon is less than or equal to this quantity, less than rho of a plus epsilon. Now subtract rho of a from both sides. Okay, so we have now the difference between these two guys. So one of them is the spectral radius of a, and one of them is the is some matrix norm applied to a to the v and then everything is raised to the power 1 over v this is living between minus epsilon and epsilon this is living between minus epsilon and epsilon and re remember that epsilon is some arbitrary positive number you can make it as small as you wish you can make it 10 to the minus 100 you can make it 10 to the minus trillion whatever you know it, it should just be positive for a, for our argument to stand and you know if, if there is something you know if you have if you have alpha living between minus epsilon and epsilon then the absolute of alpha is less than epsilon okay so basically i can rewrite this inequality and is okay so this is this is a number uh, this is actually a real valued non-negative number this is a real valued non-negative number the difference between them is a real valued number of course it can be positive or negative but actually here we are sure that this number is we are sure that it is positive because you know we have this inequality that the spectral radius is always less than or equal to this quantity but i will anyways put the uh, absolute value to match the definition of a limit so uh, so this is always uh, less than epsilon for every epsilon okay so for every epsilon greater than zero for every epsilon greater than zero 
you can you can find the big M. You can find the big M, which is related to the big N we talked about earlier, such that for every V that is greater than big M, basically the distance between these two guys or the absolute value of the difference is less than epsilon. So what, what is the meaning of this statement? You can make these two guys arbitrarily close to one another, right? Because the distance between them, you can make it as small as you wish. You just need V to be, you just need V to be large enough. This statement is exactly equivalent to the definition of the limit. This means that limit V tends to infinity of the matrix, matrix norm of A to the V to the 1 over V is equal to the spectral rays. Very nice result. Very elegant. Okay, any question? Okay, so our heroes for matrix norms, again, that are like, you, you will find them used a lot. Uh, so the Frobenius norm, okay, um, the L1 matrix norm, uh, the L infinity matrix norm, uh, the spectral norm, or the L2 matrix norm, which is basically uh, the maximum single value. So uh, those guys are, you know, you will see them a lot. Uh, but also there's another type of norm that appears, you know, the thing that I talked about, the sparse signal processing thing, um, uh, also it makes like appearance is the so-called nuclear norm of a matrix. And uh, it is denoted by this. And, you know, so this guy is the maximum uh, singular value. This guy is the square root of uh, the sum of squares of the singular values. So this guy is the sum of the singular values themselves without squaring. Okay, so this is sigma 1 of A, the maximum singular value, plus the second maximum singular value, and you go and add, you know, uh, up to the rank of A. So you just go and sum the positive, the strictly positive singular values of matrix A, and this is called the nuclear norm. So uh, basically what I need to do is to check that is a norm, and I will focus on two things. I will focus uh, on basically demonstrating or showing that basically, indeed, if you define a function as such, this function will be sub-additive and also sub-multiplicative. Sub-additive and sub-multiplicative. Okay, so uh, so basically, I don't. I think I have time. So basically, we'll do this next time after showing that actually. Uh, we can write the definition of the nuclear norm uh, using like a certain funny, you know, so basically it is the sum of singular values. It turns out that the sum of the singular values can be written as this maximum here uh, of the magnitude of a trace. Uh, very nice result on its own. And so we'll basically uh, show this equivalence, so that this is equal to that. And then we will show that basically the nuclear norm is indeed sub-additive, so it, it, it obeys the triangular inequality and it is sub-multiplicative.